Right then, on to the next bit for the A5. Cooling. So we'll uh, scoot down a little bit here. So this is a radiator not designed for this specific model. Um, but it's a bigger, thicker aluminium one. I think it come from like a tool eater or some, some petrol engine anyway, TFSI maybe. So all these inlet and outlets are all the wrong size. So we've had these custom machined and we've welded them on. This fitting here, we're going to change for production one because our car's got a different fitting on compared to all the ones we didn't have one as a sample. So we're going to uh, redo that. Our car doesn't really matter too much, but for production ones, we're going to try and do that. So the reason we're going to fit this, the coolant temps are very high on this car. We know that they're high. But the main reason it is, is because of this standard thermostat which is a 95 degree one, which is not what you want to be when you're uh, on track. So what we'll do to this, we'll take this to bits, we'll modify it and we're going to probably get it to open about 80 degrees, something like that. So it's not too cold for road use, but you've, you need to have at least, from our experience, we have a decent cooling system. If you have your set point or your thermostat opening at 75, your coolant's going to be nearer to 85 in reality. You always want to have 10, 15 degrees difference. So we've modified that, got it right. We'll list these on website for people if they're going to want them. So that's a genuine Volkswagen item, brand new one. We'll modify that. You don't want to be messing about with used ones. So like I said, we're going to get that down to about 80 because what we want on track, you don't want your oil to be getting out of then 90 degrees really. Once you start getting above that, you're going to start having it boiling in block because your 90 degrees that you're reading as it's coming out of the head is not representative of what it is in block. It'll definitely be above that, but because you're running what, probably 25 PSI, maybe pressure on your uh, header tank cap. That's why a good header tank's a good idea, or at least a working one. Water's not going to boil until probably 125 degrees, but still, you don't want to be above boiling point of water at any point on a track car, in my opinion. So we've got the radiator, the thermostat, they're the two most important things. While all the front end's off, this is another genuine Volkswagen part, made by G, GRM or GBM, whatever it is, in Germany. Just gonna put another water pump on. There's not really anything to wear out on these, but it's not an expensive item to be swapping while all water's drained down. Good idea to do that. New bolts for it. New seals for radiator pipes, which this little one, you can't actually buy a new seal for it on its own, but you can buy the full fitting from a different car, not this one. So if we have any leaking problems, we'll sort that out. Tensioner, rib belt, and then the pulleys for the rib belt as well, or the uh, deflector pulleys. We might as well swap all that. There's a couple hundred quid to do it all. In grand scheme of things, it's not expensive for this, so we might as well do it. So this is all fairly straightforward stuff. Obviously, a little bit of custom machine to do this, but not really any uh, rocket science involved to do it. These other two little coolers, <coughs> so it gets a little bit more interesting. Always use air equip hose as well. This is Dash 8. This is good stuff. In theory, with these fittings, you can just shove them on. You don't even need any Jubilee clips, but... We always put them on anyway. You can never be too sure. You can't hold the pipe on too well, especially not when it's oil. So what this little thing is, <coughs> this is a little oil cooler plate that we've made that replaces the standard heat exchanger. On these, so normally you've got your water comes in here, goes into your oil cooler, and then comes back out. So we've made a plate that just bypasses that straight around, so your water still flows as it should. And we screw these fittings on here with the seal provided. We'll screw them on there and then we can go to these pipes and uh, go to our oil cooler that we're going to mount at the front somewhere. The key to this is making sure that we don't put that somewhere that's going to make this otter because obviously more stuff you have in front of your radiator, worse it gets. We've already got an upgraded intercooler that's going to cover probably more than half of that radiator. So if we can, we'll get them out at Wayne 
fog light grill somewhere. If not, it's going to have to go above radiator or in front of the radiator somewhere. But less interruptions and airflow to that, the better. What's the worst part about this oil cooler plate is these genuine seals. Absolutely ridiculous money. So much stupid like 60 quid for these free seals. But to get to this, we're look, looking like we're going to have to take the fuel pump off. Which obviously it's not the order of doing things that we'd have done if we just had everything and did it from scratch. But as far as r and is concerned, we wanted to make sure we do it in a decent order. For the sake of 60 quid worth of seals, you don't have to do all that work again. So it's another one of them where Volkswagen know they've got your bike short and curlies and uh, they'll make you uh, pay for it. So we'll have that mounted to the engine with the new seals on, the fittings on there, onto these fit aluminium fittings, which we supply an extra couple because you can do it whichever way around you want to do it. Usually they come off oil cooler and then they go there. We might... The kit might come with an extra two elbows or whatever one we've done, but that's why we're going to test fit on ours. If somebody just said, I want one now and we've not test fit one, we'd send them a couple of extra ones as well. But we do send a, send a few to give you some mounting options. This is the bracketry that you use to mount the oil coolers on, so screw a couple of them to, them to the side of the oil cooler and away you go. I do like when we're fitting these to at least tag on to three of the mounting points, so... You're not going to rip the bottom or the top off. So if you've got you know, up to three mounting points, usually better. Obviously, when you buy these from Mocal, you only get two. So you, you sometimes have to uh, use your brain a little bit. We might end up folding a little bit of aluminium and not using these at all. But they come with bracket alt bolts and everything in brackets. So it's no big deal. So then we've got the oil cooler, the engine radiator, and obviously everything to do with that. This other cooler here is a little bit different. Because one of the reasons we're not using a off-the-shelf radiator that's made for an automatic 3-litre engine is because it's standard on this side here. Yeah, it's this side in car. <coughs> you've got like a, an extra heat exchanger that goes in and you've got two fittings, which we'll try and get a picture of that up. So you've got gearbox oil going into the side of the radiator. So it's like an extra water jacket on the side of the radiator. So like the heat exchanger for the oil, they're not just used for cooling purposes, they're also used to bring things up to temperature, so like your water generally gets up to temperature quicker than your oil. So we, um, we don't really want to get rid of all the um, heat exchanger if we can help it, but this is going to get some track use. So having a sort of water radiator that's going to possibly make the oil hotter than you want it to be or the oil that's going to make the water radiator you don't really want to be mixing everything if you can help it obviously for emissions reasons and fuel economy reasons you want everything to get up temperature as quick as you can and then maintain usually a hot temperature for obviously track use fast road use you want it to be safe so the oil is going to be independent and then the the coolant and the gearbox oil is going to be independent. So to come off the standard pipes that come from the gearbox, because they come a fair way, so to replace them, they've got some weird fittings and some some inline filters and stuff. To come off those pipes, we just use these fittings that we've got, sort of standardised side. I can't remember exact thread pattern, obviously. Dash eight at this side, but weird thread at this end. So you're going to come off the pipes that come from the gearbox straight to this cooler. We've not got tons of data other than knowing that the, the engine, oil, uh, engine coolant gets hot and the gearbox oil can get hot. Um, water we've seen over 100 degrees just, just on road so we know that needs to be cooler when we get on track. We know we're going to cook it. Um, for this... <laughs> oh dear. Um, for the, for the gearbox, there's loads of different rules of thumb for what the critical temperature is going to be. You definitely don't want to be getting past like 120 degrees, same way engine oil. Once you start getting past that, you start degrading your oil and stuff, so it's not really a good idea. But the only real way for us to get some good back-to-back -back testing would have been to take it to track, 
as it is, smash it round all day until we got it as hot as we could get it, with the potential, in our opinion, seeing the coolant temperatures, to cause some damage, which we've not got time before we take it to the Nürburgring to be rebuilding engines and screwing heads back on properly. So we made an executive decision just to do all this anyway. There's plenty of stuff online with people on the dual clutch gearboxes moaning that the gearbox oil temperatures get too high. It's going to happen. So there's no point even tempting fate and being outside at track with gearbox oil cooked and then to change it. Because if you watch one of the other videos, it you know, a stupid amount, like eight, nine litres of that oil. And it's not cheap either. So we're not going to risk that. Obviously, engine is, you cannot get too cool for your engine oil. Obviously, it needs to be, you want to be at 60, 70 degrees before you start absolutely killing it on track or on the road, which can take a little bit of time. If your water takes, say, two minutes to get up to temp, your engine oil is going to take at least five or six. But it's a small price to pay over cooling the oil to make sure that that oil that's squirting the underside of the pistons is as cool as possible because that's the first thing that goes on these engines. You're either going to breach the head because you're pushing it too hard cylinder pressure wise and you're going to have coolant pressure issues or you're going to be boiling it and you're going to have coolant pressure issues or the next thing in line if you fixed all that and your coolant stays at, like we've had engines that will sit at 75, 80 degrees coolant temperature no pressurisation, obviously, just getting up to the sort of one, one and a half bar mark where you, your coolant cap's regulating it. But then because your oil's getting to 140 degrees, only momentarily it can happen. And then you're squirting hot oil at the bottom of your piston. You just start melting ball of your piston. So rather than sort of pretending we don't know from experience what causes problems on the track, race and drag cars, we're going to do all this preemptively bit of a kill for some people. I think most people, if they're running it on track, they're going to want to do the just the thermostat and obviously might as well do all the water pump and everything while you're doing that because it's a similar sort of amount of work. But the radiator, the radiator is going to be, if you're tracking it and you've done that, you start seeing it getting hot, the radiator is going to be a good idea. Like I said, we're automatic. You're going to have the heat soak problem from your gearbox, which definitely on track or they're getting too hot and you'll start overloading your coolant system so maybe the next step for somebody would be after you've done the thermostat you're thinking do I need to do the radiator or not you can put one of these in and just leave that heat exchanger just there if you undo these you're not going to have coolant uh, or oil coming out of your uh, coming out of your radiator anyway so you could do the thermostat Put this on, and if, you sta if you've got stable temperatures, your coolant's not getting too hot, no problem. Obviously, oil, there's no factory oil temperature on this car. Not that I've seen anyway when I've had a quick look through uh, VCDS and our multifunction display. Obviously, newer stuff, like the, like the GTD that we had in. Oil on that, as soon as you boot it, 110 degrees, so we're doing an oil cooler for those. So, obviously, if you're serious about track use, like the minimal gauges that we run in our track cars, because the, the coolant gauge on most cars can't be believed. It's got a lot of, the sort of factory term would be damping, so that from 70 to 110, it stays at 90, just so you're not getting concerned that when you, when it's taking a little while to get up to temperature or when it's overheating a little bit in traffic, you don't start turning the engine off and panicking. Manufacturers have learned from uh, past experience that if the make that gauge too accurate, people start ringing them up and asking them why the car's not getting up to temp and why it's <laughs> overheating. So the minimal gauges will run as a coolant temp one. So whether that's like you can get these uh, OBD11 get scan gauges and stuff like that, just run into your phone. You can get like Talk Pro, them sort of apps and have a warning come up when you're getting above what, 95, 100, whatever for your coolant. So that's the minimum for a track car. The coolant's going to be the first indication that you've got a problem. Obviously, if you're taking it a little bit more serious, like in our race car, we've got coolant and oil temp. Another good gauge to have in a track car or a race car is an exhaust gas temperature one, which like a modern car, like common rail engines, they've all got EGT sensors. So again, you can use your scan gauge and have a 
EGT sensors in there and log them as well. It's always a good idea to log them, but put your warnings on. Because if you're going up a big hill on a track or whatever, like you don't ring and sat there for five minutes up a big hill, you might only have to just peel off throttle a little bit just to keep things from getting critical. So it's always a good idea to keep an eye on that stuff. But I think what we've got here, we'll get it all uh, chucked on car, try and record what we can while we're doing it and uh, see what difference it makes. Obviously, the immediate one will be coolant temperature. These ones, we'll do a bit of logging and see what we've got. We've got a little bit of data from these, but we've got data from what people have done when they've been in tracks, especially in petrol cars. So we'll know whether we're going to be uh, solving one of them problems. But as I've said before, you can't overcool things too much. Obviously, if you can ever get things anywhere near operating temperature so you can't actually get on it then it is a concern but none of this stuff's going to cause problems the oil cool we've not got a thermostat in there at the minute i don't think that's going to be a, an issue but if we do start having any low oil temperature problems then we'll uh, we'll stick a thermostat in there but there'll be an option on this kit for our car i'm not really too bothered i like to have less things to go wrong and less things to cause your hassle just a quick aside if people are wondering what these little pipes are for here. These are the factory pipes from one of these cars that we used to make the fittings. We've joined them together, blanked that one off, and then that little tapping that we've got there, we're going to pressure test all these before they go out like we do with all those other radiators because the first time you find out this is uh, leaking water, it won't be a good time if we don't pressure test them first. So obviously, can't help it. Couriers like to damage things like this in post, but hopefully we know we've uh, sent things out in the best condition they could be. So we'll get on to install and we'll go from there. Right then, so we're nearly pretty much on the final stretch with the A5. It's been a bit of a pain to be honest. We thought we'd planned everything, we got everything ordered that we thought we needed. But this is research and development, you find some new stuff. So one of the things we did find, which is a bit difficult to see, but it'd be easier to see, it's hidden right down here. Just see a Jubilee clip down there. Looks like it's been in there years, but that's another story. Note to self, when all oil lines are off, and uh, oil cools off, don't put your phone brake and turn ignition on for any reason, because oil goes everywhere. Um, but there's a fitting down there for the water, which we'll go over to the uh, bench and have a look, but that's got a, a union on there now that goes to the water pipe. And then this fitting here, this is why we've sort of done this video halfway through before we put inlet on this that you can see which is difficult to uh, maneuver around but 
this is a thermostat, which originally it's got a thermostat that looks pretty much the same as that one, but just with one outlet, and that goes to your EGR cooler, and there's pipes that come off and go all over the place. This thermostat's actually from a different car, I think it's from a, a transport van or something like that, which it comes in, thermostat, and then wires off, which worked perfect for what we wanted. One of the factory pipes then went onto that side of it, which when that's down there, it'll bolt underneath inlet. And this one here is a pipe from like a early TDI oil cooler. So we're going to try and see for a kit at least if we can come up with something similar at the right sort of money. Because God knows how expensive these are new. But basically, you need to get that to there by whatever means necessary. Same that one to there. If you take this thermostat out, you've got this water line goes right down there. It's pretty hard to see. It goes right down into the block. And then the other side of this, which if you feed it back all the way around here, goes to this pump here. Now this pump comes from the cold side of the radiator before the thermostat. So you've got cold water pumping straight back in after the thermostat. So that would cool your engine down. So if you got rid of your EGR cooler and got rid of that thermostat, you're just going to run cold all the time. So not a good idea this pump we've looked at the mapping for it as well and I think after it's 35 degrees or something like that it's on all the time so if then you've not got a thermostat on here it's not going to help we could have probably changed the mapping on that and only put it on at 95 degrees or something like that but we don't know what other you're still going to get siphoning effects as well and uh, convection so we're not going to want if there's a thermostat there it's kind of there for a reason so the full reason we'll never know but we want to retain that feature because we know from people's messages in the past saying they've deleted the EGR coolers and uh, the engine's not got up to temperature. So these pipes here that are still dangling out, we can't finalise these until we put the other banker uh, manifold on and put both joining pipes on there. These are going to come down and go to this cooler, which we'll have a look at in a minute. These are coming from the plate on our engine that we've uh, we've removed the heat exchanger and put this uh, plate on there that we've had custom made which that was the reason why we've got to get rid of the EGR cool so these pipes could fit in and get in here which it's not ideal we're hoping that we could keep the EGR cool and sneak these pipes under here but looking at the room that we've got it weren't going to happen so we had to wait for some bits to come in and, and do what we're doing so if we have a quick look at what's on the bench you'll see what we've changed so these are the boring bits Put a new water pump on while the radiator were off. Tensioner, that looks crusty as old, so we're glad we cha changed that. All the pulleys and the bolts that go with them. That's the other side of that thermostat. So that's all crusted up, not good. Um, so the flow, it's showing you that the flow is that way. So we, it's right what we're saying about that. The original thermostat, we're going to keep this as a spare, just in case we have any trouble. But that's obviously a 95 degree thermostat. Not a, um, we've ended up modifying it to 82 or something like that, which we'll put a picture up at how much we had to chop off this main spring to get it to open at 82 degrees, which would have liked to have been 80, but 82 were fine. So that's what you need to do. Obviously, it wants to have a little bit of a flat spot on, so do it with your grinder, cut it flat. But I'll show you that picture and you'll have to work rest out for your sen. Them fittings are still yet to go on. Um, these are bolts that we still need to go on. That's the cylinder that's going on. So that here is the jar cooler. So quite a complicated unit with pipes going all over. That's the little fitting we're talking about. Now, some of the earlier engines have not got any jar cooler like this and they've got a little water pipe that comes out. That's where we've got that fitting from. It's not expensive so it's going to be part of the kit that we do but you've got to have that to obviously get the water out but that's just a bleeder for engine as far as we can see and a bleeder for cooler so we've removed all that that's all gone so have the pipe so we've blanked stuff at this end so we've got an EGR blank will come with a kit that does that one as well so you're literally straight off the, the VPs from the turbo that's where the blank is we'll try and cut to a picture of that if we can that's to go back on these pipes here are what normally go into the radiator, which will uh, 
Oh dear, there's oil everywhere. We'll cut to a we'll cut to a picture of the radiator as well. That's um, those parts, those pipes there go into the side of the radiator and there's an heat exchanger inside the actual radiator. So you've got coolant passing in from the engine and you've got gearbox oil from the dual clutch side of the gearbox going into there as well. So like on the on the front wheel drive sort of uh, four wheel drive, four motion stuff and like uh, in the transverse cars, they've got an heat exchanger similar to this one on top of the end, on top of the gearbox these gearboxes have not so this type of heat exchanger same on the gearbox on the early ones that we're talking about on the transverse ones that we're talking about you've got your coolant goes in there in and out and then you've got your oil in and out on here as well so you're trying it the idea with all the factory stuff the gearbox and the engine you're trying to get everything up to temperature as quick as you can which sometimes it doesn't always work because you're trying to warm other stuff up as well. But obviously the engine wants to get warm quicker so you're getting efficiency. But they also, you need your gearbox to be at an operate, a decent operating temperature um, and you need your engine oil to be at a decent operating temperature. The problem you've got when you put it into a track application then or fast road, like we're hoping this is going to be, you're always saturating your coolant radiator all the time. Obviously, if we put this 80 degree thermostat on, but we're still getting... 100 degrees uh, coolant temps it could be that the radiator is not big enough but it's also because we've got these two we've got engine oil and gearbox oil saturating the water in the coolant radiator so we've, we've separated them out so we'll we'll try and lift car up a little bit and just have a little look what we've got going on there so, I'll just take this torch I thought we're going to need it I'm not going to lift it all the way up this should just pull straight off. With assistance from the cameraman. So as you can see at this side, this one's the gearbox cooler. We've managed to get it in so the fog light still fits. <coughs> Use the brackets that supply with the kit, the pipe works. So if you just look just through that hole there you can probably just see how we've joined it on it's a standardized fitting I've never seen anybody do them like this so I don't think anybody's done a gearbox cooler that we've seen but that's how we've done it anyway so we've not had to go all the way back to the gearbox so it's a fairly straightforward kit for the the gearbox cooler you could do this completely separately to all the all the other parts that we've got on here but we've got the radiator on this radiator is not going to heat exchanger, so to fit our radiator, you've got to fit this cooler because you're not going to have any gearbox oil cooling. Hopefully it doesn't mean that it doesn't get up to temperature too slowly. If it does, we'll have to put a thermostat in one of these pipes. Same for the engine oil. We've not gone for a thermostat because from our, from our use, at least the heavy track use, you get up to temperature. Maybe a little bit slower than you'd want to, but you still do get up to temperature. So the other brackets go onto the, onto the intercooler, onto our intercooler, which they're not held on very securely from the factory anyway. So, and we always like to have three points of contact on oil cools, just so you don't end up with top pulling off or bottom pulling off. Water injection hiding away there. So everything's on there. We just need to finish this top bit and run it and just see how we get on but we're not too far away from the first initial test we still need to uh, get around to finishing a few bits on it tuning wise as well but we've been fairly busy these last few weeks and uh, we've not had a good swing at everything but this should be sorted pretty soon and uh, yeah hopefully it all, uh, it all works out I would expect we've we feel we've ended up creating some decent products out of this. The oil cooler, a little bit more work than we want having to delete the EGR cooler. You're obviously going to limit the market. People that want to put an oil cooler on that don't want to get rid of um, the EGR. But the people that are going to need the oil cooler are the people that are not going to need 
the emission stuff if they're using the cars on track anyway. So it is what it is. I don't think it's going to be a mass market part, but at least if your car's getting hot and uh, you want to cool it down a bit and your gearbox is getting hot, we can put the radiator and the gearbox core on there, no problems. That should, uh, should work out pretty well. We'll get Paul to get it finished and then we'll, uh, we might do a road test, but it might be a little bit boring.